You can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Follow me there to be the first to know about my upcoming plans. Everybody. I think it's very true to say that many of the best and certainly most memorable cars in our lives are like the best people. They are in some ways deeply flawed, but they have other characteristics that make up for those flaws in such a way you're able to look past them. There are any number of car brands out there that fit that description, and Alfa Romeo is certainly one. I have driven plenty of great cars with an Alfa Romeo badge on the front, but I'm not sure any one of them you'd accurately describe as well-rounded. Every single one of them is flawed in some way, yet the best have enough redeeming qualities that you can easily see past that. That isn't universally true though, and my opinions on some Alphas have landed me in hot water on a couple of owners' forums. The simple fact is that I'm not going to give a bad car a free pass just because it has some shiny pipes in the engine bay. I have been fortunate enough now to drive quite a few of Alpha's cars from the past 20 years. If you happen to have something that I haven't driven and you think is worth featuring, please, as ever, do drop me an email and I'd love to see if we can make something. However, today we're talking about something that, even by Alpha standards, is a little bit of an oddball. It's the GT. And to be entirely honest, I'm not quite sure what the point of this car ever was. Because you see, in theory, it followed on from the reasonably long-lived Alfa Romeo GTV, the very odd looking thing that people can confuse for the Fiat Coupe because it's styled in a very similar way and that was one of these cars I simply failed to be impressed by. But it wasn't long at all after this car was released, barely two years, and Alfa brought out the Brera, in many ways the direct successor to this, however they shared showroom space for a couple of years. Technically the GT survived until 2010, but here in the UK it was finished by 2007. Allegedly the entire project was dreamed up simply as a way for Alfa to find a home for the last of the legendary V6 Busso engine. And this being an Alfa, we may as well start with that engine, because it is simultaneously the best and worst thing about this car. Alfie Stee will tear me limb from limb for saying anything remotely negative about their fabled Arezi engine. And it has certain very fine qualities. It makes a very good sound, especially with this wizard catback exhaust on it. It also makes reasonable power here, 240 horses. And you can't deny it's absolutely gorgeous to look at, particularly in this later guise. However, it's also nowhere near as powerful as, say, the BMW M units of the time, which had equal displacement yet made another 80 horses. The 3.2 is also widely regarded as one of the least durable of all the Busso engines. It has some heat issues, thanks in part where Alfa Romeo chose to fit a catalyst a converter for some of these later cars and potentially related it's also known to do its head gaskets beyond that even when it is working servicing can be a real pig this engine still has belts but much like the old rover k series v6 they are stuffed right up against the side of the engine bay which means to do a belt change on this car is very expensive and the belts gained a reputation fairly early on for not lasting anywhere near as long as they should have done which means that you probably probably don't want to let these cars go much beyond three or four years between belt services. In a car that now can cost only a few thousand pounds to buy, that's quite an expense. This engine is almost identical to the one fitted in the Alfa Romeo 147 and 156 GTA. However, in those, it produced 250 horsepower and here, 10 less at 240. 
being naturally aspirated, torque is a modest 221 pound feet or 300 newton meters. The red line is at 7,000, and the over square nature of the engine means that if you want to get the best from it, you really do have to get it into the top reaches of the rev counter. And it's quite enjoyable too. Allow me to demonstrate. This thing pulls really quite hard and makes you question if that 240 horsepower figure may just have been a touch modest. While the engine is an absolute peach, unfortunately the gearbox is not. And that's something that plagues all of these old alphas. Ahead of this review I spoke to an internet friend, Damien. If you're watching, thank you Damien, you've been very helpful. He is a big fan of the GT and has driven loads of them. He forewarned me, and I already had a suspicion of this, that gear changes are a common weakness on these cars. But they don't need to be. Unfortunately, due to various, mostly boring reasons, the gear shift on these cars is a real mixed bag. They can be very good, but if they're not set up correctly, they'll be like this. And when I say this is a bad gear shift, I don't mean it's a bad shift for a car. This is a bad shift full stop. If I were in a van and it shifted like this, I wouldn't be particularly impressed with it. First and second in particular are just horrid. You've got to get the lever over there somewhere and it's kind of like driving an old 1970s Ford which hasn't had much adjustment for the linkage in quite some time. The other thing he told me is that these are a car that genuinely comes alive with a little bit of sympathetic modification. And this particular example, brought to me by Channel Fan and Good Guy Jack, has had what you'd consider the usual suspects of Alpha GT mods. That wizard catback exhaust is the most obvious, but we also have eye back suspension so the car sits a little bit lower and rides a little bit better. The regular car is both very softly sprung but also quite crashy. That's something I've experienced in a few other cars of this type and it really is a rather unresolved ride. And quite surprising because the Italians, when they're in the mood, can do exceptionally good suspension. A Quaife limited slip differential has also been fitted, another essential, particularly if you drive the car all year round and there have been some visual modifications too. The looks of the regular GT I've never really been fond of, but this is definitely one of those cars where a few tasteful alterations can really lift it. So this car has the standard alloys, but now resprayed in gold, and they look beautiful against this black paintwork. And at the rear, you've got the subtlest of lip spoilers, and that really does make it. You can do things with the front end, but I think it's that flat rear deck that to me just doesn't work. A sporty car I think needs just a little bit of a kick or some Thing to liven up the rear end and by adding that spoiler it gives the car just enough. The truth is these cars are all now of an age where each one is an individual and you have to judge them on a case-by-case -case basis. Gear shift aside, there is an awful lot in here that I really do like. This era of Alfa Romeo is still a very old school Italian interior, so you've got some really lovely touches. This leather here, these seats are absolutely beautiful. This steering wheel has been re-trimmed, but it is a very nice thing to hold in the hand. However, you've also got some absolutely atrocious switch gear. This car is in excellent condition for an Alfa of its age, but even still, some of the little switches and things feel a little bit gnarly. The temperature and fan dials down here have a weird resistance to them that isn't very pleasant, and there are pieces of cheap plastic poking the head out between some really quite nice touches and that does ruin the overall effect. This wing mirror also seems to be in the middle of having a seizure but in a proper alpha these are all things you'll easily be able to overlook. So can you in the GT? Well yes I rather think you can. The fact it's front wheel drive is one of the many reasons I've never really been that interested in these. However, with that limited slip differential, you can't deny the effectiveness of it. I've criticized a 147 GTA previously for having a turn in that wasn't all that great. And people said, what on earth are you talking about? It has a notoriously fast steering rack. Well, this is how I expected that car to be. So maybe with that car, it was the particular example that was at fault. As you may imagine in my line of work, sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between a car that's not set up right or a model that simply isn't very good. The weighting of the steering is fairly light, but you do get used to the speed of it pretty quickly. 
And I have to say, it's one of those rare examples where somebody calling this Ferrari-like wouldn't actually be entirely undeserved. One of the mods this car doesn't have, and something I'm told is really an essential for these, is an uprated anti-roll bar. Even still, it's pretty bleeding good, this thing. And better than that, it's actually kind of practical too. You'd think, because of the coupe body styling, that this would be a two plus two, and even then, that would be some wishful thinking. But it's not. I can sit in the back of this car behind my own seating position. I wouldn't want to sit there for all that long, but it can be done, much more comfortable than in, say, the later Brera, which, to be honest, is a joke in terms of interior space. The boot may not be quite as big as the Brera's, but it's actually still a very useful size, although the load lip is pretty extreme. So if you want to put anything heavy or bulky in it, you may struggle, or scratch your paintwork to pieces. Response out of that engine is absolutely magnificent. Turning circle is pathetic, by the way. I mean, really quite tragic. That may be partly as a result of the suspension setup. These generation of Alphas had double wishbone at the front and an independent McPherson strut at the rear. A really good setup. A shame then that they just weren't that sorted from the off. In terms of fuel economy, go in with low expectations and you're unlikely to be disappointed. I would say somewhere in the 20s is a realistic average. Depending on how you drive it, that may be either low 20s or high. It really does pull harder than the numbers might imply, this car. A shame, though, that the gearbox in this one is so utterly useless. And there are some other alfre things about it, too. These seats are heated, but the switch is hidden down here, and the only way to know whether it's on or off is to either look down there, kind of dangerous when you're driving, or to wait until your bum is toasted. Parts, I'm told, are also becoming something of a concern. Pricing isn't all that hideous, but availability can be. Anything unique to the GT, do watch out. It is strange that they didn't make this a GTA model, but that may be because even for an Italian, calling it the GT GTA could have been a bit too much. Despite the lack of badging though, there were some differences over the regular cars, including a stiffer chassis. Overall grip is really quite excellent, and I know the differential is doing its job. As standard, Alpha chose not to fit a limited slip item to these cars, and that really was an oversight, because without one, they can struggle for traction quite badly. Oh, a bus has pulled out in front of me, which is an excellent opportunity to slow down and enjoy that engine a little bit more. Oh, the downshift, utterly beautiful. Steer is present and correct, as you can probably see, I'm not exaggerating that. I am delighted to say that one of the typical Alpha failings hasn't really blighted this car, and that, of course, is reliability. Now, I make no promises, and if you want to buy one of these, there'll be plenty of buyers guys out there that'll tell you all the sorts of horrible things that can go wrong with these cars, and believe me, there are plenty. Yet, in the four years that Jack has had this, there is only one time it ever properly let him down, and that was due to a split radiator hose. That's something I don't think we can really blame Alpha for. You have to remember that this is a car now about 17 years old, so things like hoses going really should be par for the course. When speaking to Damien, he told me that one of the strangest things about these cars is that, well set up, they will drive just that little bit nicer than a 156 GTA, even though they really shouldn't, because if you do the exact same things to both cars, you'd think they behave the same, same platform and all that, but they don't. And I see what he means. This is a really, really good driving car. I think the best of this generation Alpha that I've driven. Some of the others have been good, 
Some of them have been a bit lacklustre. This though is the last of all of them I would ever have chosen for myself and yet now it's the one I find myself enjoying the most. Alphas have often been famed for their rather brutal depreciation. However, there is a part of the story that people always leave out. Yes, they may lose money in the first few years at a rate that would make any German car owner blush. But when the dust finally settles and they've reached their nadir, with an Alfa Romeo, you find almost universally they will be worth quite a bit more than their former rivals. And that's certainly true with the GT. A quick check on Auto Trader this morning tells me that to get into one of these, you need to part with at least five grand and you could spend anywhere up to 10 for a much better, lower miles, well cared for example. If they're names that you recognize, so Wizard on the exhaust, Ibac or similar for the suspension, Quay for the differential, I wouldn't have any hesitation recommending a modified one of these over a standard example. That rear suspension has also been set up to have an element of passive rear steering as well. And it's one of the things that makes this feel quite so agile. I've just gone out of a Fiat Panda, and yet this is the car which feels a lot lighter on its feet and dartier. I was genuinely quite worried as well because for the first 100 yards I thought, oh no, this is going to be another underwhelming alpha. And I blame that gearbox for that entirely. The gearbox is just horrid. But see past that, and you can fix that, and what you're left with is something really, truly special. In other words, it is a proper alpha. I'd have one, warts and all. As ever, that's all. Thanks to Jack for bringing his car out, to Damien for providing a little bit of inside information, and to you for watching. Like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.